Hello and welcome to the ISSA webinar for July 19th, Prove the ROI of your GRC and security programs. My name is Margaret Toscano with ISSA International and I'll be your facilitator for today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us as well as thank TrustCloud for their generous support of this presentation. If you're not yet a member of ISSA International, please visit ISSA.org to learn more about the benefits of membership and join today. We would like to encourage you to ask questions of our speakers today. To ask a question, simply type your question in the question area of your screen. We will monitor all questions and ask them where appropriate throughout the presentation, as well as during the Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. We would like to encourage you to share your insights that you hear on social media using the hashtag you see on the slides. After today's event, the presentation slides and a recorded version of the webcast will be available on the ISSA web conference page. You will also be given the opportunity to print a viewing certificate on this webcast page on Bright Talk that you can submit for continuing education credits. All of this information will be available on a slide at the conclusion of today's webinar. I would also like to mention that we have a poll question for the audience. So if you have a moment, you can um, go ahead and, and take that. And um, then our speaker will have the information um, that those results show. Right now, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Lee Neely. Lee is a senior IT and security professional at LLNL with over 30 years of extensive experience with a wide variety of technology and applications from point implementations to enterprise solutions. He teaches cybersecurity courses and holds several security certifications. He is a current ISSA International Board member and a director for ISSA International member of the SANS News Bytes editorial board, SANS analyst, and security weekly podcast host. You can keep up with Lee at Lee, L-A-N-D, Neely. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Welcome. I don't know if I did you justice there, but um, Lee will give a brief overview of today's webinar and then introduce our guest speakers. Welcome, Lee. Well, thank you, Margaret. Don't worry about it. You did great. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about our discussion today. Um, you know, GRC programs are often viewed as cost centers, but they can in fact be profit centered, profit drivers by contributing to sales acceleration, cost and time savings and risk reduction. In this session, we'll share insights on calculating the ROI of GRC by conducting, connecting to key metrics like contractual liability, resource costs, and operational efficiency, and also provide practical examples of how to gauge program success. Attendees will receive actionable strategy to demonstrate the value of their GRC and security program, justify budgets to leadership, and improve risk management and security practices, and probably also get some hints about ways they're not leveraging their GRC that could, could help them make it a more viable investment. Now I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers, Tejas Renati and Shannon Noonan. Uh, Tejas is a chief product officer at TrustCloud, where he oversees all aspects of engineering, design, and product at the company and plays a pivotal role in driving the company's strategic product direction. Prior to TrustCloud, he served in product management and engineering leadership roles at Progress and MicroStrategy. His strong background in software development, combined with his deep understanding of market trends and customer needs, allows him to spearhead the development of innovative, cutting-edge products that help customers achieve audit readiness, mitigate risk, and accelerate the sales process. Our other presenter, Shannon Noonan. CEO and founder of High Noon Consulting is a leader and subject matter expert in the compliance and security field. She has over 15 years of experience and is an active leader bringing operational approach and drive to develop efficiencies within internal controls, ERP implementations, financial and IT business practices, including addressing and solving technical issues. She has her bachelor's of science in accounting and her master of science in accounting and information systems. She's a certified information systems auditor and certified information privacy professional. 
As part of her current role, she works extensively with customers to implement a compliance program with management and C-suite drive to drive business strategy and roadmaps for compliance, privacy, and BCDR, which assists in meeting revenue requirements and business demand. And once again, please remember to post your questions in the chat box. And uh, Tejas, please start us off. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Lee. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tejas, um, and I'm one of the co-founders of Trust Cloud. Uh, before I get into the talk, just a, a very quick introduction of, of Trust Cloud and what we do. Um, my co-founders and I started Trust Cloud with uh, two very simple reasons. Uh, the first one is we are we are all doing GRC, and a lot of what we do in GRC is still a check the box exercise. We're making all these investments, we're doing all the work, but at the end of the day, when I ask uh, folks in GRC teams and CISOs questions like, uh, a week after your audit, do you know if your controls are operating at their uh, efficient maximum? Or once you've done your vendor reviews, do you believe the answers that your vendors are giving you in their security responses? I usually get you know blank stares and chuckles and, and all kinds of reactions. And you know, that's the reality today is in spite of um, all of the automation in GRC, we are still doing a lot of check the box exercises and we believe that needs to change. The second reason we started Trust Cloud was because we noticed that after speaking to hundreds of people in this space, GRC is still being seen as a cost center to the business. And we believe that GRC has a much bigger impact on, on revenue and needs to be seen as a profit center. And that's the, the crux of what we're gonna be talking about today. So with these two ideas, uh, we started the company in 2020, uh, right in the middle of COVID, you know, who, would, who would have thought you know, what better thing to do than be stuck in your basement and start a company. So, so we did that. Um, and over the last uh, four years, uh, we now have over 500 customers who are using us to prepare for audits, to you know, automate security questionnaires, and to reduce risk and liability in, the, in their business. Um, one thing I'm really, really proud of is, is a lot of the folks that use our product are folks that are extremely conscious of security and privacy in their businesses. Um, and the, the, the topics I'm going to talk about are things that I've observed from having spoken to these folks over the last four or five years. So you know, over the last over the last several years, I've been talking to folks who are security professionals, GRC professionals in their organizations. And one thing is, is really clear to, to me. Today's GRC teams are doing a lot of disparate sets of things. Any given day, you're juggling between audits, security questionnaires, chasing down the rest of your organization to do the work, um, managing risks, uh, reporting to leadership, and many other things. Um, if I you know, poll this audience, I, I'm guessing most of you can put yourselves in several of these boxes for what you do on a daily basis. And it's really hard to manage this, particularly because your organizations are changing and also because the landscape is changing. You're constantly faced with new security requirements, new regulation, as well as keeping up with the growth of your own teams. This makes your work really valuable, but the, the challenges that, that I've seen across the board are, it's still hard for leadership to understand the impact of GRC. In most organizations, it's not obvious to the employees of the organization why they are doing their GRC activities and therefore see them as a burden. And then the final one is, you know, we think the typical security and GRC team is still undervalued. And what I've seen is that results in them having to fight for resources and budget. The most interesting thought experiment that I have heard on this topic is by uh, the former CISO of uh, Levi Strauss jeans, who, who, who I think expressed this the most succinctly in a single sentence. He said, how does this help me sell more jeans? <laughs> and I thought that was fascinating because it made me think about you know, all of us in all of our roles are ultimately sort of contributing to a business outcome. And it's a really useful thought experiment to think about 
what is our GRC program contributing to the business outcome in our businesses? This is basically what our, our leadership teams are saying to us, eh? show me the money. Um, and actually, I, I imagine you know, all of us on the other end of the phone line as Cuba Gooding Jr. going, I can't, I'm too busy answering a security question. <laughs> um, and that's the reality. So the trend, I, you know, trend I've seen happening over the last two to three years is there's, there's a shift in the industry where a lot of GRC teams are starting to realize that you know, they want to change the check the box exercise to building trust with their customers. And we call this trust assurance. There are others who have used similar terms. Uh, but the way that compliance works today is you know, you're doing it for checking boxes and, and doing it for compliance sakes. It's static, it's manual, it's document-based. It's generally pretty opaque and it's not tied to business outcomes. So a lot of what is changing is we're now thinking of GRC as a way to drive assurance. Is, is, my, is the things I'm doing actually making my customers trust me more and do more business with me? Is it programmatic? Is it accurate? Is it intelligent? Am I in a position to be transparent to my team, my board, and my customers? And then finally, am I enabling business outcomes? And a lot of what the, the talk in the industry is about is there's a lot of people talking about GRC automation, but I think automation, while it's important, just turns a check the box exercise into a faster check the box exercise. Um, Trust assurance, on the other hand, takes the check the box exercise and makes it into a trust assurance, as well as a transparent, um, a transparent posture that that makes companies trust each other. So, so that's the difference, and you know, that's what we're seeing. And finally, sort of why why should we all care about trust assurance? Uh, what I'm seeing is that the teams that are moving in the direction of establishing trust are turning their GRC programs from cost centers to profit centers. So things that are looked at as a tolerated expense are now being seen as, as revenue drivers. Uh, things that are check the box are now getting a strategic asset and getting a seat at the table in strategic conversations. And finally, uh, this is this is really um, something I uh, that's personal to me is, I think the compliance people in GRC are starting to be seen as trust champions for their business. Um, and I was talking to Shannon and this really resonated with both of us because she works with a lot of um, companies where she's sort of seeing this transformation. Um, so Shannon, if you wanna add anything to what I've said, we'd love to get your thoughts as well on what, what you're seeing. All great points. And I really love the slide is uh, it goes back to the slide where you said, how do I sell more jeans? And when I go into organizations, uh, that, that's what they're asking. How is this driving my revenue? What is this doing to benefit me? And why do I have to do it, right? Um, at the end of the day, we're trying to meet a compliance requirement or security need that another third party has to invest in us. Um, data is the driver these days. Everywhere our data is being shared and has to be secured and has regulatory requirements that it needs to meet. So how does it, how does it sell more genes? Well, it could be a marketing approach. It could be so many different avenues because if you get someone's name and phone number and address, well, now you have data requirements that could be a component that requires you to sell genes. Well, how do you get that information out there through advertisement, through all of these other components? Well, we just hit multiple compliance requirements just by talking about how you just get out to sell to somebody. Well, why are we not changing that, that revenue approach to saying, well, I need to meet compliance requirements. Why is that not built into a cost? Why is that not built into how we get out the product to the customers versus it just being overhead? So it's really just understanding what the message is that we need to communicate to our teams and really drive that we're part of the profit center versus just a, a hindrance on, on the company to check the box, right? Um, we keep hearing that. I, I don't believe in the word check the box. I believe that a company is only secure with how secure we decide to make it. But compliance can help drive security if we really teach the organization, the business units, the product managers, your CTOs, your CFOs, that compliance and security are a driver 
for revenue. And we'll get into more examples on how that's possible. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the, the going back to the how do we sell jeans. I, um, right. Like I said, love that thought experiment. Yes. Uh, so I had a question for you too. Um, I work in the government public sector. So if our systems aren't compliant, they don't get to be turned on, period. End of story. Um, so obviously that's not the same in the private sector, but is there any corollary that if, you know, that there's not just the sell more genes, but there's actually, if we fail to do this, we can't conduct business in certain ways? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I think uh, the, 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 the the really interesting way to to think about this question is there's there's a there's a component of that which is exactly what you said we need to be able to be in the business of selling jeans yeah um and that's what you're you're talking about so part of what you know, the answer is is well can we even operate without um doing some of the things we do um can we operate in a way that um our customers can trust that they can work with us um, and then there's the other aspect, which is a lot in private uh, sector, which you alluded to, which is, does doing something allow me to sell jeans in a different market? Does doing something allow me to sell jeans to a different set of people? Um, and so that's the, um, that's the exercise, which is, what is it that I have to have to operate my business? But then how, how do I tie what I do to things that it enables in terms of revenue? Um, and we'll get into some examples of both. Well, and we'll get into this a bit more, and I don't want to say that too much because you really are looking for an answer, but streamlining it. If you have a requirement to sell to the federal government versus the private sector, right, you still have security needs. And what's the base? What's the requirement? What's the rigor? What's the contract? Um, who uh, Who's your audience? So it's learning how to streamline your compliance needs so that it's applicable to multiple frameworks, not just one. Thank you. Awesome. So I think that was actually a great setup, Lee, because um, you know, what we are going to get into next is um, we thought of three lessons that Shannon and I both have uh, seen from successful teams that are doing this uh, and turning their GRC programs into a profit center. And the first one is um, to become an ally to revenue. Um, and I love this graphic and I love this term that Shannon also used, which is revenue generating compliance. Uh, turn your GRC programs into RGC programs so that they are revenue generating for the business. Um, use compliance to drive net new sales. All of us typically at some point are being, being asked to do things like answer security questionnaires, provide collateral to prospects and customers and so on. Yeah, one of my learnings has been after talking to you know, hundreds of people doing this, there's a component of compliance where you, know, you may do it out of the goodness of, the, of your heart, but ultimately everybody does compliance to drive revenue. You know, companies take on compliance to drive revenue. And so tying what you're doing to revenue acceleration in terms of the, the, the sales process that you're enabling is a great way to become an ally to your revenue team. And finally, um, a lot of companies are now starting to lead with transparency as a way to build trust. So um, typically things like security reviews are where your prospects are asking you for um, you know, how you do security and privacy in your organization. And what I'm seeing is uh, the companies that can be confident about their postures and lead with transparency can then show that they're enabling those sales cycles at a far better rate give far better SLAs and establish trust so people want to do business with you. Um, there's an example of a company um, that I've been working with uh, called BitSight. A lot of folks know them. Um, this is actually a public page that they have on their website, which talks about their security and privacy program in a great amount of detail. Um, and what they have seen is leading with this and being transparent to say, this is how we do things. And we have all of our certifications. We have previously answered security questionnaires. Uh, we have all of our controls on how frequently mon we're monitoring them. This is the kind of transparency that enables sales to then go in and say, you know, ask us any question and we are, we are in a good position to be able to answer. 
I also thought you know we we, we could talk about some specific examples of how uh, to track your revenue contribution. So if you're doing things like answering security questionnaires, it's a great idea to tie those things to the revenue that they accelerate. What were the deals that you helped close during the last quarter? And what was the revenue impact of those deals? Or what was the revenue that answering a security questionnaire on a renewal helped your company secure? What are you protecting in terms of the revenue that the company makes? Second, you know, what is it that your customers are asking you for? What is the most requested set of security and privacy collateral and documentation that you provide to your customers? Is it your SOC 2 report? Is it your pen test? Is it, you know, what, is, what are those sets of things? Because that's a great way to justify why you invest in each one of these activities because they are actually what your customers are looking for. And then finally, what is the efficiency that you're delivering to the sales process? I love this idea of accelerating sales because ultimately by providing SLAs on things like security questionnaires, your team is helping drive sales acceleration and help your, your sales team close deals. If there's a questionnaire at the end of a quarter and they want it turned around in three days and your team comes through for them, you are actually helping your organization meet its sales goals. And I think that needs to be showcased. So I've seen these used really, really well by, by companies who are using these kinds of metrics and board reports. Shannon, again, just to bring you in, I know you've, you're actually helping folks on the ground to put these kinds of things together. Um, yeah, what is, I, have, what... I have two great examples. Um, so I've run multiple compliance departments um, as an employee for organizations, as well as coming in as a um, consultant. And I have answered these questionnaires on behalf of the company because one, I had to teach them how to streamline the process, answer multiple questionnaires um, and make it easier uh, so that they can get the answers out. But the biggest thing that I, I've learned in all of these questionnaires is the sales team always needs something. They always need some compliance avenue, whether it's they have to show that they've got to meet a Sarbanes-Oxley requirement. They've got to show that they're meeting a FedRAMP requirement, that they're meeting PCI. I could go down the list of all the acronyms, right? So how do you streamline it and how do you make it more efficient for yourself, but also the sales team? And, and it's it's making sure that you've got the right answers and that you're, you've got these files all prepped and ready ahead of time. There's many avenues to that. You have many tools, right? Trust, Trust Cloud is one of those types of tools that you can use and leverage. So there's different avenues that you can do this, but I will say the benefit of being prepared and ready and able to answer those questions for the sales team and jump, being able to jump on a call is tremendous recognition in an organization. Because once they see that you're a partner and not just somebody that's making everybody do work, but you're a partner to the organization to help it grow, you become, you get more of a voice. And I think that's one of the, the areas that compliance and security teams struggle with is how do I get a voice and how do I get what I need done? Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is not check the box activities. It's actually extremely important for an organization. It's to prevent them and, and make sure they've got controls in place so that you're not having ransomware attacks. You're not having people getting into your environment. You're not having data breaches and leaks and everything else that I'm talking about, but you're having a real secure environment. Well, now you've got to make yourself an agenda. And that's the whole point of proving that you are a sales component. So if you become a benefit to the sales team, you become heard in a different way. And it's not something that you're you're lying or denying or not doing. You're doing the work. The sales team needs to know what you're doing so that they can promote it because organizations more and more, especially with everything that's going on in the news, want to know that you're secure because they do not want to put data in your environment unless it's secure. Um, and I know everybody's sitting there saying, oh, but the SOC, the twos, uh, SOC twos and SOC ones are just being handed around like candy. And, and they are, but that's going to change too because the more and more companies get breached and more and more companies have data leaks, you're going to see more rigor and role that come across because people are not going to rely on those and they're going to want to see more questionnaires and they're only going to vet out your environment. So how do you do that? You've got to make sure that you're getting in front of the sales team and you're getting in front of the teams and you're streamlining your process so that you can make it secure. I love that. Um, 
and I'm seeing a, a question here um, in from one of our um, uh, members of the audience that's around security questionnaires and on how do we deal with the current mess of zillions of questionnaires flying back and forth. I love the I love the expression zillions of questionnaires flying back and forth uh, because that's that's the reality and and that's what makes it really inefficient. Um, at Trust Cloud, we actually um, had a T-shirt made that said, "Friends don't send friends security questionnaires," <laughs> uh, because I I truly believe like this is fundamentally broken that we are one having to answer these 300 to 500 questions uh, to to showcase what we do, and two, um, ultimately the person on the other end also recognizes that they are taking your answers at face value and. Sort of one of the our missions is to sort of fundamentally change this because I think it's broken and and it's a, it's a paper based exercise. Um, so you know what what do I see happening or what what am I seeing happening? I think the the example I gave and I'll go back to it is is one one sort of approach I'm seeing happen more, which is leading with transparency in a way that uh, you basically can go and say to a lot of the, at least the, the smaller to mid-market customers, look, every everything you're likely to ask me is already here and that you can look for it. And I'm probably giving you more than you're even gonna ask me. Um, and you know, all the standard questionnaires and so on and so forth are, are answered. And I'm seeing that a lot of companies get success. You know, I have customers um, who with, with Trust Cloud's product are eliminating a, between a third and half of questionnaires using using this. The other trend that we are investing in and, and I'm seeing elsewhere as well is with um, AI coming into the space of uh, compliance and figuring out a way to automatically answer questionnaires based on things you've done before. Um, and this is something that we do as well, but I, there are other companies that are doing it where um, essentially we're training the, the model on security questionnaires we've seen and therefore the model is capable of recognizing what a question is asking about and then surface answers from your corpus of information. So those are, those are the two trends I'm seeing that um, are helping folks sort of reduce this burden. And so we, we do that as well, but there's others in the industry that are also doing it. Awesome. So. Let's talk about risk. Um, you know, the second, second, second lesson I want to highlight is um, we are all tracking risks for our companies. Uh, typically, most companies that I work with have a risk register. Uh, but ultimately, the, the the problem with risk and liability is unless it's tied to a business impact, it's really hard to communicate why action is required on risk, why budgets need to be allocated to reducing risk, and so on. Um, and so one of the things I'm seeing the companies and CISOs leading on this are that they are starting to track risks against each risk's business impact. So you know, when you're making budget requests from your, your leadership team and your board, can you prove the financial and customer impact of your risks? So by not having this risk, we are potentially in breach of certain customer and contractual obligations. That suddenly makes things more tangible and in a language that the business understands. And then finally, you know, most CISOs now that have to present to leadership on a quarterly basis have to provide justification for budgets, um, justification <laughs> for why they want to remediate certain things. And it cannot be about gut feeling because um, that's not the language of, of, of communication at leadership level. So using financial impact makes it a lot more tangible to have that conversation. Um, and one of the things that I'm seeing CISOs ask for is, can I say, you know, last quarter versus this quarter, what were my top risks? What was the investment we made to remediate them? And now how much progress have we made to make those risks less uh, apparent and what liability have we reduced for the organization as a result? And so that's what I'm seeing um, you know, the, the successful CISOs do at a regular, in, uh, on a regular basis is, is tying their progress also to the financial impact and liability reduced for the business. Um, again, I, I, I love using examples and, and some numbers. So one of the, one of the ideas that, that we're seeing a lot of people present is 
can you tie each of your residual risks to what is the financial impact? And by making an investment, what is the residual risk that I'm reducing in terms of its dollar value? Second, can you tie your top risks to what is the lower bound and upper bound of viability that you're taking on by not addressing those risks? And then ask for budgets accordingly. To say, this is what is the potential liability and this is what the budget is to, to reduce it. And then finally, I think it really matters that you highlight the people that are involved and are owners in helping your organization stay secure. And one of the things that you know, I encourage folks is with, with ownership comes accountability and with ownership also comes you know, clarity around who is responsible in the organization to reduce risk and protect the, protect the organization. So um, again, Shannon, I, I know you're very passionate about this. We had a conversation <laughs> earlier about this topic. So uh, we'd love to get your thoughts as well, but um, what, what do you see with folks yeah. who are presenting to boards with, with the risk and liability in the business? Well, um, presenting to boards is kind of difficult for our security individuals, as some of you may know on the phone, because you're always talking about hypotheticals. This could happen and could cost X, Y, and Z. So there's multiple ways that you can go about it. My favorite way um, since working at Silence uh, was to show it the other avenue. So we would sit there and say, okay, it costs, you're going to get a contract for $2 million. It costs us $250,000 to implement X, Y, and Z compliance initiative. That will be covered by that one contract that will get us. So you'll net $1.5 million. Well, what's the benefit of that? That's just one contract. Well, that could lead to a second, a third, a fourth. So by putting this compliance initiative in place, as well as the security requirements, they only had a cost of 250,000. So when I go and present that to the CFO, the CTO, and the, the CISOs of the world, and they sit there and say, okay, I understand now, what is the other impact and needs that will come about with this? And sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's not that much more, but it, as we start talking about all the different initiatives, if you change the way you talk about it, instead of saying, well, if you don't do this, it could cost you millions of dollars because of uh, a breach. Well, let's talk about how it impacts them. If you implement this, you could increase your revenue by 20% because this is going to be um, ahead of everyone else. We used to look at our competitors and compare what compliance initiatives that they were announcing to everybody else. So one of the big things was in a SOC 2, you have the ability to pick of the five trust principles, which one you wanted to do. Well, we wanted to make an impression on the industry. So we decided to do all five trust principles. Why? It was a leading leading the rest of our competitors. No one else had done that. Everyone had done the bare minimum on their SOC too. And we said, we're going to do the whole thing. We're going to show you the kitchen sink because we weren't afraid of what was there. Then we went and got PCI compliant. Then we got FedRAMP compliant. We were ahead of everyone else while we were doing it. And because of that, we got more and more sales because people saw we were secure. They saw that we had multiple auditors in there. They saw that we were streamlining. We were able to answer security questionnaires rather quickly and easily because we had streamlined the process. Now, not every organization can do that because one, it does cost money to do all of this. But because we we spun it differently, instead of it just being a straight cost center, and we showed the benefit through the financials that they were able to increase revenue, they were able to grow as an organization. It then allowed the sales team to run with it because they had the tangible capability to say, hey, we've got this that is different from your competitors. Look what else we can do that your competitors can't do. And that drove sales. So it was not only because sometimes this differential isn't the product, it's what comes with the product, all the compliance and the security benefits. So I was going to step in. You're getting a lot of you're getting some supporting com, com, comments from the audience, which is awesome. You're getting everybody thinking here. Like, <laughs> uh, one was that don't forget, we're also working, improving our company rest, reputation. And mm -hmm. another is about you know when if you are involved with working with the sales team engage early you know lead time public sector private sector insufficient lead time is not is not a win uh the, the emergency on your part cliche comes to mind and uh one question kind of got me thinking though um a person who works at an, at a, an mdr managed detection response SAS was saying you know 
could could the MDR folks help with some of this? Would that be good for a smaller business that can't insource all these activities? And I wanted your see if you had any quick thoughts on that before you continue on. No, I, I, don't, I don't know if you want to go first, but uh, I right. yes. Um, MDR SaaS companies are actually tremendous in the security, right? Because if their environment's secure, a lot of times what happens is when we get asked in certain questionnaires, do you have third party support? Do you have other people in your environment? Do you have this? Do you have that? Um, in some instances, we actually have to prove that you're secure. So are you meeting our security requirements or are you meeting yours? And that's when it becomes very interesting in some of these questionnaires, because if you're considered an arm of us, then we have to prove that you are part of our security regimen. If you are a separate entity, we have to now point to all of your compliance requirements. So that's where you're, you're seeing a lot of organizations, even with an MDR SaaS solution, where they're saying you got to use our computers because we have to trust the security and we have to get our sales sorted. Or you have to use something in our environment because we don't know what your environment's doing. So if you're able to prove and show that you are secure, you become beneficial too, and you're different differential in the environment because now you're showing that you're secure, you can prove it and you don't have to hide it, right? Because that's the, a lot of these organizations are a sub, they're not a primary. So how do they prove that they've got all of the needs and wants that they need to do to make themselves different in the industry? Really, you you have access to data, you've got to prove you're secure, and you've got to make sure that they can sell their product. You just become a piece of the pie. Awesome. Yeah, and I love uh, uh, two terms that were used earlier, which which I absolutely uh, love the use of those terms. One was uh, reputation, um, and the other one was competitive differentiation. And uh, Shannon, you've mentioned competitive differentiation, compliance as a comp competitive differentiator, where you were going above and beyond and using that as a way to you know, showcase that you are better than the competition. Um, and that's that's an amazing um, angle as well, and I. Love that other folks are also jumping on it. Very nice. Uh, before we move to the next one, there was a question that seemed relevant to what we were talking about: was how are you calculating residual financial impact? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's there's a lot of theory on this. So um, I'll, I'll I'll give the short answer, but um, I think there's 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 methods around how do you assess um, impact of risk in terms of uh, 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 numbers and uh, dollar numbers. There's there's a method that's called FAIR and there's a lot written about it. Um, I've also seen folks do sort of lower bounds, upper bounds to say like, what is the range of impact that we are uh, likely to, to uh, take on with risks? The other one I've seen used is um, what would be the cost to fix? And what is the cost of the company to, to address uh, a risk that happens? Um, and use that as a way to financially model um, the impact of a risk. And you know, the residual risk here basically is a, is a, a calculation based on you know, your likelihood impact as well as the financial numbers attached to this. Um, again, Shannon, love to see you add add to this. Like, what what are you doing in with uh, your what am I it's never easy doing the residual risk and financial impact because you have to really look into what the organization and see how honest they are being about risk because there's different avenues that you can go about it. Yeah. Um, a lot of times it's trying to figure out what the benchmark is and identifying that in, in identifying the financial impact. So every organization is different and that could be in of itself a whole agenda for us to talk about, but yeah. it's really understanding what the financial impact is and then identifying a benchmark. So you're building it into it. So, um, it could be a few things. So a lot of times um, it could be you don't have a tool implemented and that tool costs X, Y, and Z. So your risk is there. So the tool costs, say, $100. Well, can you afford the $100 to address the risk or do you have to find other controls? Other co controls could be implementing another uh, person to do manual effort, which means it's that's $50 versus the $100. So it's really doing a cost analysis against the risk. Yeah, I love that. I, I love the specific examples because that's exactly what so it comes down to people, tools, um, and you know, things you use to remediate. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I want to sort of wrap up with a third uh, lesson that I'm seeing with uh, companies that are 
um, enabling profit centers from their GRC teams. And that is, they are basically building a culture of trust in the organization. So the organization understands um, the impact of what's being done in the GRC program. Um, from talking to a lot of folks, it, it's pretty clear to me that most people in companies want to do the right thing. Uh, but there's a couple of reasons that they end up not uh, keeping up with their GRC obligations. One of them is, and it's it's unclear what is the the consequence of not doing something, or conversely, what is the consequence or what is it that they are enabling by doing the things that you need them to do. So, can we decentralize this? This is this is an idea that I've been exploring is can this be decentralized to a point where every individual that is required to lock their laptop or install an antivirus or what have you understand sort of the end impact that that has on liability as well as on the business um, because i think most people want to do the right thing um, the the way that a certain vendors as well as certain teams that i've seen are doing this well is by making it a lot easier for people to understand what they need to do in the channels where they do their everyday work. Um, one of a, one example that I, I, I really like quoting is uh, there's a company called Collide um, that has built a device management software that lives entirely within your Slack application. And so it sort of notifies you and it's very sort of subtle in telling you you need to update your device and, and install new software and so on. Um, and what they've succeeded in doing is they've basically you know, given people small pieces of work where they actually do their everyday activities. And that, that is far more successful and you know, we use them as well. And it's, been, it's been good for us. Um, the second is you know, what I talked about showing people impact is if you can tie activities they're doing to customer contracts, to revenue re retention, to risk um, and to sales, I think people are far, far more likely to understand why they are doing what they're doing and are much more motivated to do it. And then finally, I think I love saying sort of compliance is a team sport. Um, and I, I, I firmly believe, like I think uh, people who, who keep up and, and do their part need to be celebrated. And uh, you, know, you, should, you should be uh, actively encouraging uh, people publicly um, when they actually do the things that they they need to do for their um, for their company, um, and I again I, you know, just in the spirit of of giving giving a couple of examples, um, one of the things that we are trying to do is to show each individual that participates in the GRC activities how their work contributes to goals, and also how their work reduces costs. And Shannon mentioned this earlier about using common control frameworks, being, you know, showing audit readiness, and so on and so forth. The second is you know, highlighting the owners um, and teams that are responsible for maintaining your commitments. I think creating accountability is a great way to drive action. And then finally, you know, this is something we do ourselves, but I, I am a big believer in, is showing appreciation and finding people where they work is a great way to drive people to do action. Um, and so, so those are my, my tips and tricks for what I've seen working um, to drive your organizations towards a culture of trust. And again, Shannon, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um... <laughs> yeah, no, as I'm, I'm looking at this, like how, how their work contributes to goals and reduces costs, how highlight the owners who are responsible for maintaining your commitments to create accountability and track tasks in the channels where your team works and, it's fascinating these three topics because implementing compliance is a team effort, right? Compliance doesn't own any of the work other than the paperwork to get done for the auditors, right? All of the work is really managed and owned by all of the individual components of the organization, whether it's your HR department making sure they do background checks to your your engineering team making sure they do code checks properly to your security team who's doing the scans and the vulnerability scans and the pen tests. So there's all these different layers that uh, have to come together as one. And I, I, identifying and working as a team is hugely beneficial, right? It's also building into someone's job. 
how do you build compliance into someone's job? And that's one of the biggest benefits I've had as a compliance person and security person is figuring out how to build into the job. So it's a day to day task, not a once in a while task. So instead of it's every so often, they know that this is a recurring requirement as part of their job. It's built into it. But we built it as a team. We built it together. So I didn't just come in and tell them how to do it. I said, I need X, Y, and Z. Let's sit down together and figure out the best solution to do it. So they came to the table with ideas and thoughts based off of what was needed. That is tremendous with teams because now they feel like they've got a piece of the pie. They're doing something that's going to benefit them. And they're not just being told that they have to do it and they see the benefits of it. So as we look at it as a team effort, it's not just going in and telling someone they have to do it and telling them how to do it. It's going in and saying, I need X, Y, and Z. Here's some options. Do you have any solutions? Do you have any ideas? Do you do you know what else to do? And sometimes they come to the table with some great ideas that you wouldn't even thought of. Maybe automate it, maybe make it simplified, maybe cover multiple controls that you didn't think of. Um, and that is the, the benefit of all of this, of making it a team effort versus just one team telling them they have to do it. So. Yeah, I see Lee nodding as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, so. and there's a question here that it, it kind of ties to this, where it says someone mentioned earlier this book, you could put someone into context how this involves sales and profits. Those of us working in public sector still have to maintain compliance and track risk. Your comment regard business impact is universal. So that's the type of thing we'd like to learn here. So it, it, the, in general, whether it's public or federal or anything like that, sales and profits, teamwork, we all have a piece of this and we all have to make it. If it becomes a federal, it's usually a regulatory requirement, right? HIPAA is a regulatory requirement, Fed, FedRAMP. Um, has DFARS and FARS regulatory requirements. Sarbanes-Oxley has regulatory requirements, um, so on and so forth. And the other thing is to look at security in of itself is just not one piece. So when everyone hears Sarbanes-Oxley, everyone runs because they think it's financial. Well, Sarbanes-Oxley actually has um, security requirements that people don't think about. User and access user access requirements, change management requirements, which is all code. Um, they have backup requirements. So as I hit those topics, people on the call are probably sitting there saying, wait, we have to do that in PCI. Wait a second, I gotta do that in FedRAM. Wait a second, I've gotta do that in HIPAA. So it doesn't matter the regulatory requirement, they hit all the same topics. It's just a matter of how much more rigor is required. Is it required to remove a user within 30 days versus 90 days? Is it required to do something within two business days versus five business days? So it's really identifying it and saying, how does that impact me? And if it's a regulatory requirement, the financial impact is you can't sell in those environments without meeting that regulatory requirement. You can't get a federal requirement unless you're meeting DFARS and FARS. You can't you're not supposed to get any healthcare require contracts unless you're meeting HIPAA's regulations. So you're still a sales component because technically speaking, as part of the rules, you shouldn't be selling into it unless you're doing X, Y, and Z. Thanks for grabbing that one. That's, that's an excellent answer that adds a, a, a bit more to it. Um, the, uh, you know, and, you know, don't pull that answer apart because it's going to be specific to your industry and your interest. If you, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. So we talked about three, three, three topics and three lessons. Um, you know, becoming an ally to revenue, you know, tying risks to their financial impact, and then finally getting your organizations to build a culture of trust and, and make compliance a team sport. Um, I want to sort of wrap up with, with, you know, this, this personal mission, as well as the mission for us at Trust Cloud, which is, I think GRC professionals are doing this really important work of keeping the commitments that the company is making to customers, um, as well as protecting the board and leadership from liability and um, helping them keep their commitments to, uh, to the board and investors. And I think it's time to celebrate and socialize the impact that we have. Um, and so one of the things that we are on a mission to do is to help folks in the GRC um, discipline share share their work and why it matters to their companies, uh, publicly celebrate people who are doing great work and you know, 
call them out and, and talk about them um, in forums where they get recognized for what they're doing. And then finally, have a space where we're connecting with other GRC professionals, um, both to learn, but also to, to find inspiration and encouragement. Um, to do our part, um, one of the things that, that we're launching and, and I'm really excited about is um, we have a community where we have uh, free resources, including um, learning material on all kinds of topics around security questionnaires, compliance, and so on. Um, and then we are also showcasing companies that are doing great work and individuals in those companies that are becoming trust champions. And sort of my ask for everybody here is uh, it, this is time that that folks in the GRC space have celebrated each other. And um, I'd love to see more folks doing this. Um, and I know Shannon's also really passionate about it. I've been I've been following her her LinkedIn feed for for weeks now, and uh, she's one of the trust champions who's who's doing this. <laughs> Um, so, so with that, you know, I wanted to wrap up, um, leave, we have more questions. I'd love to take additional yeah, questions. We do um, have a couple, um, one I've seen a couple variants on is essentially, uh, what tools are you using? I mean, we've been talking completely tool independent agnostic in this one and, or, you know, and tied into that, uh, you know, the, the, the holy grail, I guess has been is, is to have our compliance activities questionnaires answer more than one framework set of questions. So I don't have to send you the PCI, the HIPAA, the, the NIST, whatever separately, I can cover that. Um, is, and is there any, any, I should choose more wisely or has that become a, is that actually a thing across the board now? For compliance, it's like a tool for questionnaires. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's, there, they, the term they use risk tracking tools, but I'm, I tried to kick it up a level to cover what we're talking about in the GRC space. Uh, so so there's more freedom. Yeah. So there's many tools out there, right? Um, I, I don't have a list of them specifically. A lot of it is researching it. The dilemma with these tools and these questionnaires, um, just like you said, is they, the questionnaires evolve because uh, someone will come with you with a SIG light. SIG light will change the next year. So in essence, how do you make sure you streamline that and constantly update and update your content? And that's, that is using a tool of sorts. Um, I, I'm not going to list them all here, uh, but we could definitely do something sidebar. But a lot of it is just understanding what it benefits to you guys. And yes, use a tool to help with the questionnaire. But when you start answering those questions in a tool, they don't go away. You have to make sure you're looking at those questionnaires in the tool regularly and updating with the context of your environment because that information gets stale quickly, especially as your company evolves and, and moves and migrates. So in essence, um, you have to really um, do certain things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oops. Can I finish this? I have five minutes for the, my presentation. Okay, so while uh, I just blink because Shannon went, went went off for a second, uh, I think she's gotten somebody interrupting her. So, how about this one about automatic converting answers from one format to what somebody else? For example, you talked about uh, BitSites website where they had all their questionnaires and stuff, kind of things you could could uh, see, but. How about making sure that, you you know, what you say and what they say match the mapping, you know, I say potato, you say potato, right? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, great any, question. Any, any, any hints there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. And uh, it's one that sort of I've been thinking about for a while. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've taken an, a, a unique approach to this where uh, we're calling that programmatic risk assessments, uh, programmatic vendor assessments, where the, the idea is, you know, Ultimately, all uh, Shannon talked about this. Uh, compliance frameworks ultimately have commonalities and typically sort of base themselves off of common control frameworks like NIST and so on. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the ways to sort of create a translation mechanism is to have you know, NIST or something that is a common framework be the the information exchange format where companies can exchange information in a way that it both ties to the same common sets of controls and. Again, this is this is not this is not a solved problem, um, but it is something that sort of multiple people are exploring um, around creating a common language that allows you to have programmatic risk assessments across companies. 
Um, and that is how, you know, you may have a SOC 2 and I may have an ISO, but we still probably do multi-factor authentication. And therefore we can still exchange that and say like, our requirements can match. Um, the other question around, around BitSite and, you know, their page. So by the way, the, I'll, I'll give them a shout out. It's at bitsite.trustshare.com. Uh, that's where their page is. Um, what they've done is, 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 is turned this completely on its head and said, I will lead you uh, with all the answers you need and a search box where you can type in your questions. And so if you care about SOC 2, um, well, type in the question you want me to answer and I'll automatically answer it for you on my trust share page. Um, that's what they're doing and they're finding great success in that. Um, so that's another way where I basically turn it over to, to the, uh, the reviewer to say, well, I'm pre presenting you with a search box with every piece of information you're going to need from me. Um, and therefore, you know, go have at it. And that becomes a really great tool for a salesperson to open on a sales call and say, let's, let's, let's talk about what you need us to answer. Let me open up um, this page where I can search for all of them. Well, awesome. Thank you. Um... As we're getting up to the top of the hour, any last things? I uh, shall we or shall we close it out? I mean, this has been awesome. I wish we could talk all day on it, but I, <laughs> there's a decided risk of Shannon getting kicked out of the conference room. She's she's taken there. I, I should we should have sent somebody to block the door for you. And you know what the heck. Um, and uh, like I said, this has been awesome. You two, I've I've enjoyed it, and I wish we had more time. Um, Joey, yeah, likewise. I think I, I I loved I loved to hear um, how many members of our audience are sort of also seeing the same kind of patterns and and sort of trying to 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 make their um, you know, GRC programs stand out and become profit centers. I like you said. I I think Shannon again hearing about your experiences and like what you're doing on with your customers is, has been great. Yes, agreed. Yeah, please ask any questions. Um, I am very passionate about this topic because it does help drive organizations and also get security really recognized for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. And that's that's what people need to understand. Um, it's learning how to speak the other language. And, and most people don't get it, but IT security and business functions speak different languages, even though we all speak English here in the U.S. But uh, I will tell you learning the, to speak different ways and how to talk to the business units is tremendous and it's really spinning it for sure. Awesome. Well, Margaret, you want to take us out? Sure. I hate to be the, the, the uh, bearer of bad news, but it's coming to an end. Uh, I think everyone did a great job. Um, wonderful presentation and great conversation. So um, just want to thank everyone for joining us today and just re-mention a few of the things I mentioned when we started. Um, after today's event, the presentation slides and a recorded version of the webcast will be available on the ISSA web conference page. And again, you will also be able to print a viewing certificate on Bright Talk to submit for continuing education credits if needed. Um, of course, if you have any questions, please contact us at member services at ISSA.org. And in closing, we invite you to join us for our next webinar, um, July 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is hosted by our Women in Security Special Interest Group. And the topic will be getting your budget approved by your board and executive staff. Um, Again, I'd like to thank our moderator, Lee Neely, and our speakers, Tejas Ranade and Shannon Noonan, and of course, our sponsor, Trust Cloud. Uh, thanks again for joining, and have a great rest of your day.